Good afternoon. You can say good afternoon back. Good afternoon, I like Cheryl. that. A little participatory <laughs> stuff. Good afternoon. Um, uh, the Joint Committee of the Parks Department and the Waterfront Committee is now in session. My name is Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the City Council's Committee on Waterfronts. I'd like to thank <laughs> Council Member Mark Levine, the chair of the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation, for agreeing to hold this joint hearing today. I'd like to welcome the administration, the advocates, and members of the public to our hearing, which will focus on re-examining the role of the Parks Department Marine Division in regulating waterfront access. The waterfront is booming. There is a renewed interest in all sorts of activities associated with the waterfront, whether they be recreational, environmental, or commercial. We have seen steady increases in boating, both recreationally and commercially, with New Yorkers enjoying waterfront parks, taking ferries to work, and even swimming and kayaking in several places in the city. And that once would be considered untouchable from a recreational standpoint. This rise in waterfront activity has led to the potential for more safety hazards. For example, nationally, in 2015, there were 4,158 boating accidents involving 626 deaths and 2,613 injuries, which resulted in $42 million in damage to property. In 2015, New York State had 16 reported boating fatalities, with two in New York City. In 2014, New York's fatality rate was 6.0 deaths per 100,000 registered watercraft putting New York 30th in the nation. According to the Coast Guard, the major contributing factors in boating accidents are careless or reckless operation, operator inattention, no proper lookout, or operator inexperience. In the coming years, safety issues will be a paramount concern on the waterfront, especially as recreational boating continues to boom. The Parks Department, through the Marine Division, is the main city entity that interacts with recreational boaters. DPR, or the Parks Department, has jurisdiction over 15 marinas, three of which are operated by the division, with the remaining marinas being operated as concessions. It charges fees, charge for docking, which vary, which vary based on the size of the vessel, the season during which one is docking, and the location of the marina. For example, prices can vary from $1,325 for a vessel 20 feet long or less during the summer at the World's Fair Marina in Queens to $3,000 for the same period at the West 79th Street Boat Basin. The division's work includes posting kayak and power boat safety rules signage at each launch site and coordinating with the U.S. Coast Guard to distribute all city advisories issued by the Department of Homeland Security. The division also works with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to remove derelict vessels that may pose public and environmental safety hazards to the city's waterways. The division's dock masters also conduct safety inspections to custom vessels, docks, and mooring field equipment and facilities annually. Further, the division engages in educational efforts by distributing no wake and safe boating advisories at the beginning of each boating season to, per to permitting boating customers and to concession marina operators, providing via website and physical copies to kayakers and boaters a kayak and boating safety information package for all boaters who apply for annual launch permits. The information in these packets typically include navigational and safety guidelines, equipment rec recommendations, published launch site rules, vessel float plan instructions, and emergency contact information. It is clear that the DPR Marine Division plays a crucial role in regulating recreational boating and waterfront access for New Yorkers. That is why it is incumbent upon city policymakers to ensure that the division is well equipped, staffed, and funded to deal with the increased amount of recreational boating. Waterfront advocates have long called for the need to ensure that recreational boaters 
are trained and aware of the rules when it comes to boating in city waters. This hearing will examine whether the Marine Division is sufficiently equipped to address these concerns, as well as whether additional efforts need to be taken by the division to train boaters in safety and regulatory recommendations. Thank you again and welcome. And um, now Chair Sorry. Mark Levine. Well, very briefly, because you gave um, exactly a, a thorough and, and concise summation of the issue, I'll just point out that we wanted to hold this hearing today because while all New Yorkers know that the Parks Department manages parks, not everyone knows that the Parks Department manages miles of beaches and piers, marinas, all sorts of waterfront assets, all of which are getting used uh, at record levels as the waterfront has come back alive as waterways have become cleaner in recent years. So now is the time to ask the kind of questions that the chair laid out about safety, about pricing, about public versus private uses. And I'm really thrilled we can have this conversation now uh, on a topic that is uh, more current than ever. Uh, I guess I'll do the honors in acknowledging our colleagues that are here or were here. We had uh, Councilmember Borelli, Councilmember Deutsch, we have Councilmember Cabrera, Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Mizell, and did anyone else depart? We'll, we'll acknowledge them later. And I guess we're going to open it up to the administration. Oh, we had uh, Jimmy Van Bramer and Joe Borelli. And we're going to turn it over to the administration for their testimony. Yes, we'll ask you, uh, uh, Committee Council Chris Sartori, uh, do the affirmation. Chris Artori, Committee Council, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees today? I do. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Rose. I feel like you've already presented what we do very well, so thank you. Um, good afternoon, City Council Waterfronts Committee Chair Rose, City Council Parks Committee Chair Levine, <coughs> and members of the, of the Council Waterfronts and Parks Committees. My name is Nate Grove, and I'm the Director of Citywide Marine Operations for New York City Parks. Thank you for inviting us to testify today regarding recreational waterfront access. I'd like to begin by providing some context on New York Harbor and the Parks Department in relation to boating and the city's waterfronts. On any given day in New York Harbor, you'll see a variety of users sharing our waterways, from recreational human-powered kayaks and stand-up paddle boards to small speedboats, sailing schools, ferries, water taxis, cruise ships, and commercial vessels. New York Harbor is the third largest port in the nation. And as Michael Day, the US Coast Guard's captain of the port in, of New York and New Jersey has stated, our harbor sees the most diverse range of maritime uses. As you are aware, the Coast Guard is the primary entity responsible for protection of the US maritime domain and the US marine transportation system and those who live, work, or recreate near them including 520 miles of shoreline here in New York City. Coast Guard personnel inspect commercial vessels, investigate marine casualties, license merchant mariners, and in cooperation with local authorities, manage our waterways. <clears throat> As it relates to our waterways, New York City Parks has a dozen marinas, vessel mooring fields, motorboat launches, and mobile boat hoists that support recreational, commercial charter, passenger ferries, and human-powered boating throughout New York City. Parks also maintains over 40 human-powered boat launches located throughout the five boroughs. We work with a variety of nonprofit and for-profit on-water groups that operate from parkland, including Manhattan Community Boathouse, Inwood Canoe Club, Harlem River Community Rowing, Row New York, East River Crew, Long Island City Boathouse, Sebago Canoe Club, Red Hook Boaters, Kayak Staten Island, Wheel Fun Rentals, and others. Generally speaking, Human-powered boat storage, excursions, and rentals departing from city parkland are facilitated by these third parties or our concession marinas and are not managed directly by New York City Parks. Parks Marine Division is presently comprised of 18 full-time dock masters, marine mechanics, maintenance workers, and city park workers. The division's primary responsibility is staffing, maintaining, and securing Parks' three in-house run marinas. These are the World's Fair Marine in Queens, Sheepshead Bay Piers in Brooklyn and the 79th Street Boat Basin in Manhattan. 
Permittees pay to dock their vessels with us year-round, and in the case of the World's Fair Marina and 79th Street Boat Basin, this requires that we have staff coverage at, at site at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Through our operation of these three marinas, Parks Marine Division also hosts a robust series of marine and water safety education programs throughout the year. Thousands of New York City students visit our marinas each year to take part in water safety instruction from our expert dock masters and participate in educational sales aboard the historic tall ships for which we, we reserve dockage space throughout the year. On the topic of vessel operator safety, Parks Dock Master staff works directly with the Coast Guard and NYPD's Harbor Unit to promulgate New York State navigation rules as determined by the New York State Marine Services Bureau, as well as best practices for safe boating in New York Harbor and its surrounding waterways. This includes posting slow and no wake signs on relevant park properties, as well as installing and maintaining no jet ski buoys in park waters. Kayak and motorboat safety rules signs are posted at each park's launch site, and our staff coordinates with the Coast Guard to distribute all New York City advisories issued by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security including the UN's visit in town this week. In support of its responsibility to manage our waterways, the Coast Guard also promotes and facilitates the activities of harbor safety committees. These harbor safety committees are local associations comprised of maritime stakeholders who, may, who meet regularly to discuss and develop local solutions to waterway safety issues. Members of these committees typically include commercial and recreational vessel operators, kayaking and paddling clubs, terminal representatives, marine pilots, state and local authorities involved in port operations, and other interested parties. In addition to the Coast Guard organized New York Harbor Safety Navigation and Operations Committee, or Harbor Ops, Parks Dock Masters participate in a range of boating safety and security committees throughout the year, including the Port of New York and New Jersey Maritime Security Committee, the NYPD Operation Nexus Counterterrorism Program, the Passenger Vessel Association Council, as well as No Wake Zone and Educational Tall Ship Water Trail Task Forces. In addition to ensuring the myriad users and stakeholders in our harbor are receiving relevant and current, current maritime regulations and advisories, these committees also provide a forum for cooperation and open discussion among the harbor's diverse parties to address the challenges of our shared waterways and develop non-regulatory solutions to better ensuring the safety of all users. These committees have been established to both develop harbor best practices and also create mechanisms for relaying these best practices and recommendations to its users. For example, as part of the Harbor Operation Education Subcommittee, Parks helped organize last year's Shared Harbors Tour that assembled recreational boaters, paddlers, ferry, and other commercial operators aboard a New York Waterways ferry to identify potential conflict areas and to get an on-water view of the harbor from each other's perspectives. We are working on making this tour an annual collaborative event among the harbor's various users. At our marinas, <coughs> Park Stockmasters conduct safety inspections of customer vessels annually at minimum. We also host vessel safety days at our Parks Run marinas in coordination with the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, where custom customer vessels are boarded and inspected for all required safety gear. Parks Marine Division distributes no wake and safe boating advisories annually to our permitted boating customers, as well as to our concession marina operators located in each of the five boroughs for distribution to their customers. In addition to a rules of the road document highlighting best practices, Parks Marine Division also provides a kayaking and boating safety informational packet received by all boaters who, who apply for an annual launch permit at any of our five permit offices located in each borough. This informational packet includes navigation and safety guidelines and equipment recommendations, as well as our published launch site rules, vessel float plan instructions, and emergency contact information. This packet also, links, this packet also includes links to boating safety courses for both motor and human-powered vessel operators. All this information is available for download via the park's website as well. Our, re our website also links directly to the New York City Water Trail Association website, where human-powered vessel operators have access to additional resources regarding safety and best practices. At this website, boaters can view a comprehensive safety video describing the challenges of our multi-user port environment, as well as videos specific to paddlers, motor boaters, sailors and pilots, sharing the blue highway, and Operation Clear Channel, respectively. This is a very well-documented instructional video series with interviews, live on-water footage of vessel interactions, 
and practical demonstrations of best practices and safety measures recommended for the full range of vessels operating within our port, from paddlers to massive cargo ships and everyone in between. Finally, on, the important issue related, on, on an important issue related to boating safety, we would also like to note that New York City Parks has been leading the effort to address the issue of derelict vessels and other marine debris abandoned in our city's waterways and shorelines. Parks Marine Division worked with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to establish the city's first ever standing requirements contract, which enables us to remove derelict vessels that pose public and environmental safety hazards throughout the city. In addition to the grant funding we have secured for this work, we continue to work to identify reoccurring operating funds to address these issues on an as-needed basis as they arise. As we hope today's discussion will make clear, New York City's waterfront offers a wide range and tremendous variety of recreational opportunities for all New Yorkers. And New York City Parks works closely with other city, state, and federal ent entities to ensure that every New Yorker can enjoy our city's waterways safely. Thank you for the op opportunity to testify today. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, and for the record, could you identify yourself and your position? Sure, Chair Rose. Or, yeah. Um, so, Nate Grove, Director of Citywide Marine Operations for New York City Parks. Okay, thank you. And I'm James Wong um, with New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm uh, co director of NYC Ferry here for QA. Okay, um, let's start with some numbers. Can you track? trends on how many boats are using public assets to launch into our waterways? Is that number increasing? Sure. Um, what we can track are the number of individuals who arrive at one of those five permit offices, one in each borough, uh, to sign up for a kayak launch permit. And that has increased since we launched the uh, water trail about a decade ago. Last year, we had 471 individuals go into a permit office to get a, get a kayak launch permit. So that's about uh, double what I saw several years ago. So there are definitely more recreational boaters on the water. Uh, that's largely also, though, I mean, that number is small when you think about the number of paddling groups that are out there, the downtown boathouses, the Manhattan community boathouses, the Long Island city boathouses. I see a lot of them in the room. Um, so the, the predominant count are going to come through those groups. We don't get those numbers directly from those groups. And how uh, do you measure mechanized boats? Okay. Yes, uh, Chair Libby. Um, uh, that's a harder one. Um, we, we look at trends in the industry. Uh, we, I don't want to put myself out of a job. I, boating is, is, is an expensive activity. Um, I haven't seen a huge increase in boating during my tenure. What we saw was a decrease after Hurricane Sandy with people taking their insurance payments and calling it quits. What are the sayings? Everyone's probably heard them before, but so spare me. The two happiest days of a boater's life, the day they get their boat and the day they get rid of their boat. But, <laughs> but truly, they're, uh, they are um, they're expensive amenities. Um, and uh, you know, we're in the business of trying to make it affordable. But more directly to your question, our numbers have stayed current at our marinas because we make them accessible. Um, you, you mentioned the rates, Chair Rose. World's Fair Marina, for instance, um, we make it affordable for people to stay in boating. Um, you do see some developments like Brooklyn Ridge Park Marina, and that's a good litmus test to see if people will come out and fill these marinas with, with, uh, at market rate. 79th Street Boat Basin, for instance, has, takes 12 years to get a slip. It's one of the best deals in town. That's even harder than getting a rent-regulated apartment. Uh, <laughs> What about safety numbers, uh, numbers of fatalities or non-fatal accidents per year? And is that trend going in the right direction? So I have to profess, um, really not something that would, would come across our radar. That's, that's truly, no pun intended, that's truly U.S. Coast Guard's domain. Um, we, the, the incidents that I've observed um, that seem to get the mind share I think rightfully so, have involved jet skis. I remember after 4th of July in Coney Island Creek, two people fell off the back of a jet ski. There was an accident out in Long Island. Um, we, as an agency, have banned jet skis in our waters across the city. We've had lobbyists come up from D.C. trying to get us to reverse course. We have banned them. We've found that they're disproportionately, because people sit on top of these things, not in a, in a secure cockpit, that, uh, that the number of fat 
I won't say fatalities, accidents and, and, and incidents related to jet skis uh, far outweighs the benefit of allowing them on park. So anytime I see someone on a jet ski in New York waterways, which is fairly frequently, they are breaking the law. Not, nah, uh, we get the question a lot. We don't allow them in our waters, in, in parks waters. We don't allow them at our launches. However, they're able, private operators are allowed to, to use them on their property, sure. And when you get out into the navigable channel, you're allowed to use them. They're not banned. This is a, this is a city policy. Got it. So again, so you don't have numbers on fatalities. So I do not. Okay. Would that be the Coast Guard or NYPD? Coast Guard. And you don't know what the trends are on that? I do not. Okay. James, you're here because of the, the NYC ferry. Yes. Are, there, are any ferries launching from parks properties or are they all DOT owned properties? A number of the ferry... Sorry, uh, a number of the ferry landings that we have for NYC Ferry are uh, are on Parks property, where the upland is is managed by Parks, and we are building a landing that's in uh, that's in the water from there. Um, some of them are, but most of them are on Parks property. Yes. Okay, so does the Parks Department uh, pay for the capital upgrades in those cases, or does DOT cover that cost? So during the implementation of NYC Ferry, um, EDC bore the, um, was building out the landings, so that's the barge and the gangway. Um, EDC built those and paid for that and will be maintaining those uh, going forward. Uh, things that are from the actual esplanade and the upland continue to be parks responsibilities. Okay, I'm gonna pause and see if my colleagues have questions. <coughs> Council Member Traeger, welcome and please. Thank you. I want to thank first uh, both chairs. Uh, this is actually a very, very important and timely hearing topic. Uh, the reason why I ask is because uh, in uh, in my district, which in, which includes the actually Coney Island and the beaches of Brighton too, the way the district was drawn, uh, one issue and challenge that we have is um, uh, jet skis that often sometimes get very close towards the beaches, and this is actually an issue that came up this past season where uh, actually NYPD Harbor patrols uh, our waterways as well in addition to the Coast Guard. Uh, NYPD Harbor asks the Parks Department to place markers. I'm not sure if the technical uh, terms are uh, buoys maybe or bowies. Uh, and the Parks Department has concerns that people, swimmers like to go out to these things which causes unsafe conditions for them but it becomes an enforcement challenge for NYPD Harbor because they don't know where the jet skis uh, need to stop getting close to the shore. Uh, some jet skis have been pictured and photographed getting very close to the shore, very almost n near the sand. So if you could speak to this, are you, are you aware of this kind of this issue and tension between NYPD Harbor and parks and where do we stand right now? Well, sure, uh, Councilman Traeger. I, I didn't prepare that topic Directly, I am familiar with it. However, um, I know it was looked at at a commissioner level, um, and what what was described to me was in 1996, Parks did exactly what you recommended. Um, they put out those buoys, and they found that it led to uh, real more conflicts with jet skis and swimmers. People absolutely swim out to them. They absolutely do. Um, however, I believe uh, did that come up at the town hall? I, I think that was one of the not items. at the town hall, but it came up at, at a uh, community board meeting. Um, where really the NYPD is expressing concern about enforcement issues because when they try to write tickets, sometimes they get beaten because the jet ski uh, folks say, well, where's the markings for wh where, where, where I can go up to? Uh, and then I get complaints from beachgoers saying the, the jet ski is literally right by my child who has just, just entered the water. So how do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, would have to get back to you on that, um, Councilman. I, I haven't been briefed exactly on what the determination was. Um, certainly maintenance would be a consideration. Whenever you drop anything in the water, it's, it becomes a maintenance, a real maintenance issue, getting out on the water, making sure they don't drift and you don't create a bigger hazard. Uh, however, we'd have to get back to you on exactly what the specifics uh, from, from the agency's perspective. Okay, uh, I, Chair, I'll get, return back to you, but I just wanna make, make the committee aware that this, this was a challenge of this past season. Good, good to know, Councilmember Traeger. I believe Councilmember Deutsch has some questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I represent uh, Sheepshead Bay, and uh, I'm sure you're well aware 
what's been happening in Jeep Sedai. And it just amazes me that I'm looking through the testimony and we're speaking about uh, safety in our waterways, and it doesn't mention one word about safety um, once um, the boats come back to, uh, to shore. Um, so first of all, my question is, is that does the permit process uh, go through your office, um, or does it, or is, was it at the discretion of the borough commissioner? Mm -hmm. Sure, Councilman Deutsch, and, and, um, <clears throat> and sincere, thank you for being so hands-on on this issue. Um, it's really been one we've been focused on this year, uh, thanks to your advocacy and, and other electeds. Um, <clears throat> I think you're asking, do, does the Parks Department issue permits to the commercial vessels that dock at Cheapside Bay Piers? We do. Uh, however, uh, these are commercial operators. So we take lead from Coast Guard. Uh, we, ha we have a certain list of requirements that any commercial operator must follow. So our job is vetting that all of their paperwork, all of their, uh, all of their operations are in compliance. Their, their passenger safety vessel plans have been submitted and reviewed by Coast Guard. Um, they're properly insured, they're properly Coast Guard documented, properly Coast Guard uh, inspected, and also that they have valid captain's licenses. Once they satisfy those requirements, then we're able to offer them a permit on the piers. So uh, in Sheepshead Bay, we have issued seven permits uh, for seven different boats. Uh, each, um, the capacity of each boat holds about 350 people. So you have approximately over, um, close to 2,500 people that leave the piers uh, at any given time. And these are party boats, uh, also known as booze cruises. So they leave at 7 p.m. and they come back at midnight. And then you have 2,500 people coming off the boats while you have 2,500 people uh, boarding the boats at the same given time. So when you talk about the permitting issue and whatever qualifications they need to pass, why aren't we taking into consideration of how many people are actually waiting uh, to come off the boats and get on the boats at the same given time? You have close to 5,000 people at one given time in Sheepshead Bay, that's number one. Number two is that why isn't it in, in the permit process that there has to be proper trash receptacles that when you have such a lot, large crowd uh, coming off or boarding the boat? And why isn't it considered, why isn't it taken into consideration that there are enough restrooms? Just uh, this past weekend, um, I have a video that was sent to me that one individual was urinating near someone's car on the street in front of um, parents pushing baby carriages um, in front of waitresses uh, who work at the local restaurants uh, with no shame, just urinating right in the middle of the street. So why aren't these things taken into consideration when you issue a permit? And because all these things you're saying, vessel safety and everything else, but this, is, this, should, all, this should all fall under the same type of guidelines to make sure that once people come off the boat, people are safe there as well. Again, everyone deserves to have a good time, and we don't want to you know, take away business from boat owners, but it has to be done in a way that doesn't, uh, um, doesn't affect the public safety of the people living in the neighborhood, as well as the boat goers, because it's a public safety issue for them as well. When you have so many thousands of people and many who may be in tox coming off of, of, a, of, a, of a booze cruise. So it's a public safety issue all around. It's an issue with trash going into the bay where we don't have any vessels that clean up sheep's at bay. And, uh, and as well as not having enough um, bathrooms. I mean, if you have 5,000 people and each boat has one toilet, and where they're gonna go while they're waiting, to board or when they come off the boat. I mean, it's really, it's, a, it's an issue all around. So what are you doing as far as Sheep's at Bay and learning from this in other areas to change some of these policies they have? Sure. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, absolutely, and, and, and there's been quite a lot of uh, focus on this, as, as you're aware. Um, regarding public safety, um, just by way of context, you know, we hear you loud and clear. I, I, it does. It does bear. Um, when I, my first assignment out of Chiefs of Bay was in 2005, when there was a shooting death off of Sea Queen, George and Patricia Swad's boat. Um, I'm happy to say that we haven't repeated that sort of public safety incident in the last 12 years since I've been focused on that site. Uh, PD uh, is involved with quality of life issues out there. You're absolutely right. It's a lot of people getting off at the same time. Um, but uh, fortunately, what we did do was was coordinate. We took a, lo a lot of measures. Um, I was heavily involved with U.S. Coast Guard uh, boarding these boats, making sure they're not overcrowded. I also worked with uh, NYPD Special Investigations Unit to make sure that the club scenes that were proliferating on these uh, were, were, were being kept in check. They were following certain promoters. We were looking at exactly who was pro pro uh, programming these boats and would have uh, PD there ready for those. And the proof is in the pudding. Um, it's been 12 years without a similar incident. Um, these people are operating legal businesses. They've satisfied all of the requirements uh, to run a business at these facilities. Uh, we certainly agree with you, though. It, it is a lot of people. We do require each of them to have a container or containers at the beginning of each pier, which they do do. They have to uh, cart that themselves. It's part of their license agreement with us. Um, they certainly have more than one bathroom on their boats. Uh, particularly if it's a K-type vessel, you're going to have more bathrooms. Um, we've always looked at that idea of staggering. That's a challenge. That's, that's an idea that's always come up. After, after 2005 with that shooting, uh, that was one of the topics that was raised. Unfortunately, the nature of the business is there's those two cruise times, and that's how people plan those events. They said that they have set customers that come every year and have the same schedules. Um, let me make sure I covered all the uh, trash in the water. Well, um, unfortunately, we're surrounded by CSOs. Thanks to the, I was with DEP this morning. Incredible work going on, combined sewer overflows. Um, however, I always, I, people always stop me and say, why are boaters so dirty after rainfall and we have all this debris in our waterways? Sheepshead Bay is, unfortunately, is an inlet that the, wa the water, when we have a CSO event, the stuff just washes right into it. And you're right, trash on the sidewalks, all that stuff can wash into there. Um, so, uh, however, and through cooperation with your office, we've, we've kept focus on that. It does wash out. It would be nice if it didn't pollute our, our larger oceans, but it does wash out over time. But um, this year, we heard you loud and clear. We stepped up enforcement. You've seen that in the last month and a half. Additional Parks Enforcement Patrol, incredible expenditure of resources there from the Parks Department, as well as our 61st Precinct, NYPD. So we're well aware of it. We want people off the boats, in their cars, and not being a public nuisance, not being a public disturbance. In addition, um, the mayor announced last Thursday at your town hall that, I'll, I'll just quote the mayor on that, um, that we're going to make a change. This current party boat season is about to end. We will, over the winter, find a new location for the late night party boats away from residential areas. So that is a big move. Um, we'll see what that means for the boaters themselves. They claim, I think rightfully so, that, uh, that they have to run that second charter at night to be able to make it profitable. But we'll see. We're going to work with them to see if we can find other locations, as the mayor stated last week. And what happens if you do not find another location? We'll have to get back to you on that. Now, I'd like to know that if there is no, the mayor did announce that if next year we'll find another location, but if there is no second location, what will happen uh, before next season? Sure. Well, we've got, we've got a little time now. Um, the season is winding down. So we're, we're, you've got all sites focused on how to figure out how to accommodate these businesses. Look, Obviously, New Yorkers are enjoying it, right? That's the problem, you know, that too many people enjoy this activity, and it's an undue burden on one particular area. So we're really focused on trying to relocate them. Uh, if we're unable to, we're, we're, we'll have to look at what other remedies we have. Um, on the issue of garbage, I also think at the town hall meeting that DEP committed to bringing a skimmer boat into the harbor twice a year. So kudos on that as well, that, um, that we're, we're going to have cooperation from DEP in helping to clean up. You're going to have to time it. However, right after rainfall, because otherwise they're going to come and everything's going to be fine. So if another location is not found, um, so the commitment will be, would be that you would reduce the amount of party boats and still limit the party boats before 11 o'clock? Okay. To reiterate, so as, as the mayor said, we will find another location. 
So in other words, it's guaranteed that by next season that there will be no evening late hour party boats and as well as reducing the amount of permits. Is that correct? W different, d two, two separate questions. The mayor said we will look to relocate these late night charters. We will be doing that. Um, one allowance, we're gonna see <coughs> what other facilities present themselves. We may allow them to still dock there overnight, but not do pick up and drop offs for that late night charter. So number of permits may stay the same. However, the number of charters after, I think it was midnight we determined, I, 11 or midnight, um, are gonna end. So in other words, you will still have about 2,500 people waiting in Chiefs of Bay if the permits still remain at seven. At seven? Yeah. You're saying seven boats carrying 300. It's, it's a little bit less than that. However, um, um, at seven o'clock, yes. It, it's, it's, so do I you believe that's not a safety issue or a uh, sanitary issue? or uh, an issue for emergency vehicles to respond into that area when you have 2,500 people waiting outside it, um, in a few short blocks? Uh, if we find an issue, we will work with PD to address it as we have. I well, I actually, I would, like, I would like to have a commitment that you will reduce the amount of party boats, uh, permits you, you, you can be issuing to party boats for next season. Um, I think it's unacceptable to have thousands of people waiting at one given time in a, in a small area. So I appreciate the, that the mayor has announced and um, that you're gonna be eliminating the late night party boats, but having seven boats in the past, you only had three at a time, and to have seven permits issued at one given time is totally unacceptable. Okay, well, we can certainly look at it, council member. Um, the issue that was presented to us was the late night party boats. Um, I, I've been there 14 years, I can't remember when there were three. Um, for, what, for, for, the sake of, for the sake of context, um, we turn away party boats. Unfortunately, the fishing industry is heavily regulated by DEC, what they can catch and keep. We still, fishing boats outnumber party boats two to one. There's 19 permits, 13 of those are fishing boats. Um, we continue to accept fishing boats as they apply, and we've accepted the number of permittees. One has been relocated from another location as we redo World's Fair Marina. Um, we'll, take a, we'll take a look, we'll take a stronger look at the, uh, at the permits over the winter and see what we can do. Um, I, I, I think, again, though, to, to really come back to the, the increased amount of focus and, and cooperation, um, it's a pretty big measure eliminating these late night charters from there. That's a, that's a big first step. It'd be nice to see how that goes and then we can also look at this uh, idea of reducing even the earlier charters. I wasn't aware that was a, a major issue. Um, how many offices are assigned to Sheeps at Bay when the boats are during the, the evening hours on the weekends? I don't have that information in front of me, council member. We can get that to you. How many officers? How many officers, yeah. yeah. Sure. How many uh, how many parks employees are out there? Sure, we can get you that information through the borough commissioner's office. When was the last time you and Sheep said Bay when the party boats left? <laughs> we do a lot with uh, our staff. I had mm -hmm. my uh, deputy director out there watching uh, comings and goings, making sure that volume on their radios were down till they're out in the channel. All the, all those measures we've been focused on over the last uh, decade plus. So. Um, we go out there on a, on a fairly regular basis. Would anyone try to drink five gallons of water and wait outside there for one hour without a bathroom? Sorry, can you re-ask the question? I said, would any of your staff members drink a five gallon of water and wait outside in Sheepshead Bay without any bathrooms for an hour? Um, this is what it's when like. When does Applebee's close exactly? Well, Applebee's okay. doesn't allow cus okay. outside customers to use their restrooms. So what, at the end of the day, what I want to say is, is that it's, you know, we spoke about ending the late night party boats. And to me, it's totally unacceptable when I don't get a response, I don't get an answer, I don't get a definite answer that you will be elim eliminating and reducing those party boat permits. It's, it's, it has been a public safety issue, a sanitary issue, um, 
and all around. So I don't understand, this is the first time you're hearing this. I've been screaming about this all summer long. So I, I would love to have a commitment that the permits will be reduced, uh, the late night party votes will be eliminated, and this way uh, the quality of life is brought back into Sheeps at Bay. Okay, we hear you, Council Member. Thank we'll look you. into it. Uh, Council, we'll acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Menchaka as well as Council Member Gorodnik, and I believe Council Member Traeger has a follow up. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs. Um, on the topic, you know, uh, just continuing the conversation about the uh, the health and well-being of our waterways. In addition, to, you know, I, I share the concern of my colleague Councilman Deutsch about Sheep's Bay, but I also want to bring up bring to your attention uh, Gravesend Bay and Coney Island Creek. Um, earlier this year, if you're aware, uh, back in early April. Uh, we, I learned through word of mouth, not through agencies, uh, that there was a 27,000 gallon oil spill that went into Gravesend Bay. Uh, and when I contacted uh, folks from the Parks Department, um, the, the answers that I received was that it, it's, it's a state and federal issue. Um, the city really doesn't have much jurisdiction. Um, I do believe we need to do better than that. Um, I learned through word of mouth, someone bravely uh, sent me um, an email memo that was circulated within DEC. Uh, in addition to being horrified that 27,000 gallons of oil spilled into the bay where people fish, not just for fun, but for, for dinner, um, there's a section in the memo that read Media, community interest, none. It was none because no one knew about it. Uh, but the city kept letting me know that this is a state and federal issue, so I am working with state lawmakers to change the state law to require notification because DEC claims that they're not required to notify people when something like this happens. Uh, but I'm also a little bit annoyed and concerned that the city does have some say here, and I want to just get your thoughts. Does the city have the power? I mean, I'm, I'm told the fire department has to be notified with this, within a certain amount of time of an oil spill. Uh, does the city have, what is the notification process for the city when oil is spilled in your bay? Because when I spoke to the parks department, they seemed to, to punt it to the state and, and, and to the feds. Uh, but I'm also told that FDNY needs to be informed within, I think, 24 hours or so. So can you speak to the, no the notification process? Because my concern, in addition to oil being in our bay, is how do we inform the public about, about w w what just happened? Mm -hmm. Sure, Councilman Traeger. And I did, I did follow the coverage, um, certainly from a, from a boat, from a water perspective, use perspective. Um, my division is interested in those topics. However. Uh, the information you're receiving is correct uh, as it stands, um, and we post similar signage throughout our marinas that when there is a spill, there is a there's an emergency spill response number. It's the it's the it's a 24-hour covered uh, spills hotline number. Whether it be a dumping, whether it be gas, a, a boat that goes down, we call that number. My dock masters are are trained to call that number, and that go does go to DEC. It does go to Coast Guard. Those are the agencies that are funded to respond to those emergencies via, via booms. It was the Exxon Valdez spill that funded Coast Guard to be able to get out there and respond to those sorts of incidences. I don't think D DEC will in investigate. However, it's really Coast Guard that has the maritime muscle and the contracts in place to respond to those things, and we report those issues up. But what is prohibiting the city from notifying the public as well? Uh, I, I, we could look into that. I, uh, again, the, the, the information flow is, is as I described to you. It's, it's supposed to be through the U.S. Coast Guard to, well, I, to local mariners. We get advisories from U.S. Coast Guard. Um, they blitz out that information. Well, I have to tell you, I was not satisfied with the information flow because I had to find out through word of mouth and I had to find out through an email chain that someone just happened to share it with me because they were courageous enough to share it with me. Um, I'm also not happy with being told the city has no jurisdiction when I'm now hearing the city is considering legislation 
trying to grant itself jurisdiction about notification. I am working with state lawmakers to make it a state law requiring every municipality to notify the public. Uh, I just want to hear, you know, and I'm not sure I'm getting an answer from you. Is there anything prohibiting the city of New York from notifying the public when there's an oil spill? I, I'm sorry, Councilman. I, I don't know what that exactly that mechanism would be. Uh, <coughs> as I understand, those mechanisms are in place. However, if there's uh, recommendations, we could certainly consider it. Well, it, that mechanism was not in place uh, this time. Um, I learned about it through word of mouth, and uh, this is something that we will be following up on aggressively. Thank you, Chairs. Okay, I believe Chair Rose has questions. Thank you, Councilmember Trager. Um, as you know, that um, the Waterfront Committee has looked at uh, the safety in our waters since our waters are shared um, with our maritime businesses, our industrial businesses, as well as recreational and private watercraft. And so safety has been a, a huge issue for us. In fact, we convened a task force during the summer and, um, and the issue of safety, boater safety uh, throughout the harbor was uh, a big com concern. And so um, I was wondering, what are, what are some of the common infractions that you've seen committed by recreational boaters? leave that to um, my staff now. Uh, common infractions. Well, um, one of the biggest, uh, without a doubt, uh, when I came into uh, this position at Parks, uh, one of the biggest infractions I saw was a, a dearth of, of making sure that people have insurance and registration for their vessels. And it sounds like boring stuff. However, in my mind, from, from, from overseeing the operations of these sites citywide, it's a really key thing to focus enforcement on. Um, we took pains to make sure that everyone who brings a boat into one of our facilities has insurance and registration. It's twofold. Number one, the insurance is the obvious thing. If an accident does occur, that there'll be someone to respond. On a less obvious level, it also results in fewer abandonments in our waterways. If, if it's insured, there's an insurance company that will come and get it. So we, we, we adamantly pursue insurance with the city of New York as additionally insured. Of course, I can't do that citywide. I can, however, do it for our in-house sites. And we've since rewritten of all, all of our 10 concession agreements to make sure that all of our concession marinas enforce that as well. Now, registration is an, is an interesting one. Vessels that have a motor need to be registered at the state level with DMV. Um, uh, for us, first of all, it's identifying who's really docking at our facilities. However, secondly, one of the, one of the things we strongly advocated for was the New York State um, uh, Boating Safety Course Rule that was put into place in 2014. I'll read you what that rule was. If you were born on or after May 1st, 1996, you were required to successfully complete a state-approved course and obtain a boating safety certificate to operate a motorboat. Additionally, all persons, regardless of age, must complete a boating safety education course in order to operate a personal watercraft jet ski on New York State waters. So we found that requiring, the important point there is when you register, when you go to register your boat at the state level now, if you were born after May 1st, 1996, you have to show proof of a boating safety course. We think that is probably the most effective measure that we've seen put in place in our time. And again, that went in place three years ago. We were vocal advocates for that. And so if, um, if they do not possess this certificate, they are not issued a permit? So if, if they, from, to break it down into its, the two permits, let's first, I think I understood your question. Let me first make clear. You will not get a vessel registration from the Department of Motor Vehicles if you do not present that boating safety, safety certificate. Similarly, we will not permit your vessel to dock at our facilities if you don't produce that Department of Motor Vehicle registration and insurance. And what about human-powered vehicles? Uh huh. So human-powered vessels aren't, um, aren't required. They're uh, similar to hand-built vessels. Um, there is no state requirement requiring them to have registration on those vessels. And, and what do you do in terms of, of safety training, um, boating safety for human-powered vessels? Sure. Um, well, I think the testimony covered that to some extent. Um, 
We, um, I have some of my notes here. Um, I just want to make sure I covered all of those. Um, the, I want to I want to stress that the, the number one um, kind of filters. Obviously, we talked about all of the materials we make available that we put at our launch sites, directing them to our permit offices. Every launch site, we just redid a whole new branding of our of our of our signs throughout the city. So every launch site will have one of these signs. So any boater who wants to go out and use these launches is going to see this. They're going to be directed to our permit office. We, it's a nominal fee. It's fifteen dollars. It's really just to get them into our permit offices get these best practices into their hand, vessel float plan, emergency contact numbers. Um, similarly, as I mentioned, many third parties, many who will testify today, I'm sure, um, that we cooperate with, that, that we also disseminate this information. We learn from best practices and push out that information. Those are our predominant users, are these third parties um, throughout the waterways. Um, and again, it, 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 is, it is these harbor operations committees that are required, Coast Guard's required to organize these throughout the, throughout the, the country. Uh, where these various groups get together and share best practices, push out those best practices as well. And so um, you distribute these best practices when they come to get a permit? Correct. They is have to. There, is there any proof that they read them, follow them? They, uh, how do you enforce that they even read them or, or know mm -hmm. that these are actually the requirements of the water. Sure. Well, where, where, we, where we can, we do. And again, there's 520 miles of shoreline in New York City. So we, we're happy that they're coming to our permit offices, number one, and at least getting the information in their hands. Because let's be clear, anyone can launch anywhere they like, quite frankly. Um, NYPD Harbor is not going to be trolling the shorelines to see people launching their kayaks off their backyard. However, um, when we can control it, we do, namely at our marinas where we have, as I said, 24-7 coverage. Our, our dock masters will stop people, make sure they have the recommended safety gear, a PFD, a noise-making device, navigation lights. Um, if, if they're not compliant, we won't let them launch there. If there's a reported incident, our Parks Enforcement Patrol will get involved to the extent they have the, the, the resources to do so. Before we uh, permitted SUPs, stand-up paddle boards, we had uh, summons being issued up in northern Manhattan. Someone kept launching their SUP. We eventually worked it out with legal that we should catch up with everybody else and include SUPs as a permitted craft. But So, so how do if you ensure that um, – are, is there someone at each of these – license um, launch sites to ensure that people, the, the boats are this safe and that they have the equipment that you you recommend? There, there is not, Chair Rose. There are over 40 launch sites throughout the five boroughs. Again, this was largely a designation of launches that already existed. Uh, a lot of the natural launches that people were using throughout the city that weren't marked and there was no formalized process, but when Commissioner Lewandowski picked up the project of the New York City Water Trail, and, and I worked on that with her, uh, we made sure that all of those launches that people were already using were properly signed. So what is the procedure? What's the protocol for an emergency, if, if there's an emergency, med um, a medical emergency on the water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that is, that's that is you know, we're not an on-water agency, so we'd, uh, we'd, we'd, uh, we'll often overhear from Coast Guard or NYPD Harbor of emergencies that take place. Sometimes they'll use our facilities and we'll learn about it that way. And um, are the, when they register or they get the permit, are there, um, is there anything put in place to ensure that they have some kind of communication device, uh, like a VHF radio or, or something that uh, they could communicate on shore uh, to the shore um, in the case of an emergency, <clears throat> and I'm talking about human power craft. I understood. Um, well, we, we, we. Let's be clear about what's um, required and what's advised. Okay, um, maritime law, federal law, requires a PFD, a noise-making device, whistle or air horn and navigation lights if operating after dark. We include VHF radios as a measure that, if properly trained, is a useful tool as well. Let me, however, this is a topic that- Who enforces that, this? Let, 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 well, let me, yeah. Again, I, I, I think we, we uh, answer that insofar as at, at the facilities, we will, um, that we have dock masters, we can enforce that. At um, 
when, when PEP is aware of an issue, they can enforce that. How but many dock masters do you have? I have six. You have six, and you have over, what, 40 launch sites, you said? Uh, Parks has, has over 40 launch sites citywide. Over 40 launch sites. Mm -hmm. And so um, how do you even profess to cover? Um, you, you, you don't. You don't. You don't. You can't. You, you can't. So you, again. So you're leaving, you're leaving um, pretty much boating safety from your locations um, on the the user on New, on the user well, again what i can what, what i can tell you is new york city again when people come to come to this city there is no better organized city i've compared notes throughout the country in fact because we've looked we've looked at some of these reports these ntsb reports all the recommendations that are in there we already do those videos, those safety videos that we publish, we have more groups operating in this city to disseminate this information and push out this information. There, we, we, um, compared to across the harbor, people are, are overwhelmed by the amount of information and collaboration that this city meets with. The shared harbor tour was a first of its type where all these collective groups got together and saw the vantage points. Um, if you have, again, if you have additional ideas, Chair, we're certainly welcome to them. Um, is there any regulatory agency that mandates training for, hand, um, for human powered vessels that are going to navigate um, New York Harbor? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, again, to be clear, um, and I'll, I'll go further, um, there was a national effort to require boaters to, to, to have a, let's, let's start with power boats, let's start with the more obvious one, um, to get Boating, get certified in boating safety. This was a national effort that was started in 2004. National Boating Safety Advisory Council recommended that the Coast Guard seek statutory authority to require recreational boaters in U.S. waters to possess a certificate showing completion of a boating safety course. Right. This recommendation was renewed in 2007, sorry. After more than a decade of working with Congress, the Coast Guard has not been able to obtain the authority to require boater safety education, and the Coast Guard believes that further efforts would likely not be successful. So even at, at a, a powerboat level, there is no um, national requirement. Similarly, human-powered craft, there, there is no precedent for requiring a boating safety course. We certainly make all of that information available. There are courses out there. We make those available on our website. Um, our New York Water Trail Association is an incredibly robust organization, but there is no federal nor state mandate requiring a boating safety course. How is that possible that um, there's no regulatory agency that um, that can mandate that the boating safety is a requirement. Uh, why, what, are, what are the obstacles to that? You said the Coast Guard, Coast Guard can't tried. do it. Yeah. What, what are the obstacles to that happening? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd have to guess at it. I, I don't want to guess at it. I can tell you the Coast Guard and, and, and uh, New York State Marine Services Bureau looks at these issues. Um, mm -hmm. And Coast Guard tried to do this nationally um, and, w and wasn't successful. Okay, I, I, I hate to like, you know, beat a dead horse, but um, we saw our kayakers hurt because of the ferry incident in, in New York Harbor. And, um, and I'm not sure if everybody who goes out there reads the packet that you give them. It's not required. There's nowhere that says that someone has to be certified or, or know the rules of the water. So um, it just seemed like since the Parks Department has the ability to permit, to give permits for use, that there would be some way that you could require a boating safety course. No, okay. Could you tell me about your resources? Your, um, you have a marine division. Could you tell me what, what your resources look like? Sure. Um, so let me just pull up my... Uh, so presently, um, it's, a, it's been, it's been a Personnel fun to, and fun to watch. Yeah, fun to watch um, my little baby, baby grow here. There was no marine division when I came in. Uh, the parks were, the, the marinas were an extension of our 
Riverside Park in the case of Boat Basin, um, Flushing Meadow Park, so they're operated as part of that, just as any park would be with city park workers. Uh, during my tenure, we've, we've, we've become a division. Um, what it comprises of now, I mentioned in my testimony, 18 full-time staff, we're down two, hopefully we'll, we'll get those back, but um, we're, uh, so at full count, we're at 20. Um, that's made up of dock masters, maintenance workers, marine mechanics. Um, the, uh, our budget specifically is 1.73 uh, million, 1.73 million per year. That's comprised of 1.27 million in personnel services and 460,000 in other than personnel services. Um, that budget allows us, we're also a revenue generator for the city, which is nice. We, through permit fees, docked at our marinas, we actually operate, including with fringe, we operate in the black. Um, and that, so that operating budget gives us the resources we're able to uh, do a lot of the stuff we talked about, the external programming, including vessel safety days, the water safety classes, and participation in the various water safety committees is all covered within that budget. Um, one of the initiatives we took on uh, three years ago uh, was life rings and call boxes at each of our launches where people can get into water above their head so it's not at grade, it's not a beach where they can step off a dock. There's eight of those launches citywide. So we also, with that budget, cover replacement of life rings. Uh, we have a contract that we, we give money to NYPD to re repair call boxes in those areas. Do you have a uh, watercraft? How many watercraft do you have? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we have, I think it's four or five on a good day, four uh, that are typically in operation. And that's really for within the marinas, um, if we have to tow boats from, from dock to dock, we'll do the occasional um, outing to uh, one, of the, one of the islands. I know we took some of the council members out to North Brother Island. Um, <laughs> and, and what what kind yeah, of craft uh, is that? What uh, it's a it's uh, it's it, a it's twenty five <laughs> foot parker. I've got my chief dock master here, but it's uh, so those are those are just small kind of recreational boats. We have a Zodiac, um, which which we can do short little ferries. We did ferries from Barreto Barreto Point Park Beach out to North Brother Island to get people out there if they were not afraid of getting wet. But yeah. do you have any kind of um, watercraft that uh, could assist? A, a boater in in distress. We're not trained to do that. You're not that's not to do no. That. That's not yeah. something that. that and I know. heard you tell um, Councilmember Deutsch something about the skimmer. Is that sure? Yours. Well, again, thanks for the advocacy of the um, no. <coughs> um, Department of Environmental Protection City Agency has um, has skimmer boats that clean our trash booms. Uh, when the CSOs that that some of the trash booms they put around there. And uh, Sheepshead Bay is one of the areas that, that uh, Councilman Deutsch was seeking for them to come into. And, and does the Marine Division um, engage in any ins ins inspection process for any watercraft that uh, was granted a, a permit? And if so, how frequently do you do those inspections? Yeah. That was another one of my lifts. Um, when I came in, we, we had a number of non-running vessels, uh, particularly the 79th Street Boat Basin. Um, so one of the one of the in the last rules change, uh, I worked uh, closely with the boating community and electeds, or corp council, to make sure that all vessels are seaworthy and operable. So if a vessel has remained at dock um, for more than a season, our dock masters require them to do a vessel safety, uh, a, a, a sea trial. Particularly in this you know day and age of hurricane after hurricane, it's very important that people be able to leave their slips should they need to. Similarly, as I mentioned, we do vessel safety days where we have U.S. Coast Guard come into our facilities mm -hmm. and board these vessels and, and do vessel inspection checks. And then if we feel there's an issue, uh, we ultimately have authority to board their vessels at our, at our docks. It, we don't need a real cause if we feel that there's uh, security issues that, or safety issues that we need to address. Do you keep some kind of record of, of violators or people who have issues? And, um, and do you... Are there any consequences for the? Sure. Issues? Yeah. Um, if it's a particularly egregious, we'll get um, we'll get we'll get PEP involved, Parks Enforcement Patrol, and we'll issue their their Environmental Control Board summons, and we'll have them if they're docked without registration, for instance, if they're not coming into compliance, mm -hmm. we can we can do a summons that way. Um, we had we had an oil spill once. We called the Emergency Spills Hotline. Had PEP come. Uh, Coast Guard wrote a violation, and Parks Enforcement Patrol wrote a violation as well. I know that um, Council Member Vinchaka has some questions. Thank you to the chairs uh, for this.
discussion. And, and uh, I, I know some of these questions were already answered, so I'll, I'll, I'll stick to a couple that I think are going to be important as we kind of review the larger question about our waterfronts and access to them. So I guess the first thing I want to ask is, is as you've, and was, thank you for kind of giving us the history of the evolution of, of the office, and it sounds like you're kind of growing the presence and there's st staff, personnel, and, and new regulations. What is, what is the current kind of participatory process for communities outside of the usual suspects to help think about how we access these um, launch sites? Yeah, sure. Um, well, thank, thank you for raising it, Council Member. Um, I can really speak passionately about the p participation. It's really, uh, I'll spare the room, but it, there's, Don't there's, spare there's, us. A, there's Tell a truism. Us. It's, it's that this is the undiscovered sixth borough, okay? Um, it's been thrilling. Why have I stayed at it for this duration? It's because the amount of participation, the amount of involvement, where to start, I mean, where to start and stop, Billion Oyster Project, uh, Harbor School, it's thrilling. It's really thrilling, and, and it's wonderful to see the participation. You've got, you got a lot of people out for your committee here. Um, uh, you know, we should all be focused on this, absolutely, and how to navigate it safely, pun intended. Um, so in more specific answer to your question, Council Member, um, one of the missions I saw was trying to make these for boaters and non-boaters alike, okay? So uh, when I first got there, it was gates, just boat, boat owners only. Um, 79th Street Boat Base in ADOC, which we recently completed reconstruction of. Um, that was the first public pier. When I got in, I said, we should make this public. We should have a kayak launch, and we should, hope it, we should uh, ho host open, uh, open houses, boating safety days, learn about boating. I call it lab, and, and our dock masters take out school groups. We work in cooperation, and it's nice, it's nice being in the Parks Department. We can provide pro bono dockage to our educational partners, tall ships. The demand is there. We had a nice task force trying to, we worked closely with EDC on that as well, in terms of how, where, to position, where to position these boats throughout the city. Um, it's, it, never gets, it never gets old. You get, you get kids down there who are surrounded by water and their eyes light up. They light up when they see, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I'm surrounded by these waterways and, and the marine growth, the, the, you know, the, the, marine, the marine growth, I should, that's, that's, that's our, our, you know, we, we also have to say vigilant on our capital infrastructure as, as, as our waters get cleaner, our, our deterioration rates go up very high. So, um, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question directly. In terms of forums to, to, to garner that, those opinions, um, it, it, I, I shouldn't take too much credit. You're gonna, you're gonna hear from Metropolitan Waterfront, or Waterfront Alliance, sorry, Roland. Um, you're gonna hear from North Brooklyn Boat, Boathouse. You're gonna hear from uh, Long Island City Boathouse. Uh, the groups keep growing, it's fantastic. And, and uh, the amount of advocacy, uh, you, you'd have to have your head in the sand if you, if, you, if you can't find one of these groups and figure out how to participate. The, the City of Water Day, when Waterfront Alliance took it from just Governor's Island and Liberty State Park to in your neighborhood. I mean, we're partners with them, and, and to a large extent, Guardians of Flushing Bay. Every time I wake up, there's a new group advocating, and we're doing cleanups twice a year with Guardians of Flushing Bay and, and to clean up those waterways. We're doing open paddling days. Um, it's insatiable, the end. And, um, and again, that's why this is appropriate, to really talk about how are we navigating that, how are we getting best practices out, out there, how are we engaging the public so that they're informed. Well, th again, thank you, and I'm, I'm glad you, you kind of gave your kind of full, full energy to this because I, I, I really agree with you. I think that this is going to be the catalyst that will expand the, um, the work to communities that have never been engaged before. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the Red Hook Regatta. Um, in, uh, have you attended, attended before? I have not. We have, so the, we have a very popular paddling um, program out yeah, of Valentino Red Hook Park, Boaters. Red Hook Boaters. Super popular goes every year. We're really excited about it. Uh, come uh, September 30th, one to five. It's a. It's it, the energy that I heard from you is is manifested there, and it really kind of brings. And I'm not going to go too fur further into. I have another question. Uh, it's going to. I think manifest. It, it has manifested a, a kind of community organized um, uh, effort to bring to bring communities that had never been been there before. So I, I really hope. And Pioneer Works is one of the big. And they're working with a whole bunch of other other uh, artists and sci scientists, and they race the boats uh, off the landing. Um, the other big big area that I think is still in its infancy is Bush Terminal Park, uh, a parks department park on EDC 
property and is yet to fully realize its, its, its potential, including a possible landing, official landing, which we don't, we, we don't have. We have a dock yet to happen. So the reason I asked about participatory process is there's a lot of participatory excitement in the district and we want to work with you to really think about how we put energy, effort, and capital dollars to do that, but also allow that to be, you don't get new landings all the time. And so it, because it could be a new landing, it can really take all the points that were discussed today and think about how do we want to craft it? Can this be a new model uh, as we move forward that um, that, that I will I, I will also can offer my my expertise and, and energy as well, and then finally the consistency. So you have you have a sense of consistency that or a, a need for consistency with multiple agencies that are engaging in waterfront access. Not only do you have EDC and the city and, and parks, you have Port Authority, and these things make it difficult. Doc NYC as a contract. Um, make it difficult for people to understand why can I do it here and I can't do it there. And so speak to me on that front about where, where are we going citywide to think about this holistically and where you could do things in parks and you can't do some stuff in others and vice versa. What, what do you see your vision from where you're, gr where you're growing your constituency within the city about how we can get to more consistent uh, policy? Great question, council member. Thank you, and I'm sure you'll you'll make good on what you said about getting getting the community involved. So so thank you. Um, you know, Red Hook's a, an exciting place out there. Um, my thoughts, uh, I, I, I kind of have to sleep on that question a little, but I'll take a, a whack at it. Um, you're right. Uh, there's a there's a there's a penalty of these kind of you know, who's, who's responsible here, who's, who, you know, whose jurisdiction is here. It really, I mean, it really comes back to creating those forums. And, and I really, I, I got to give credit to originally Municipal Arts Society that, that spawned Waterfront Alliance. Um, you know, those, those waterfront tours, those, those conferences that are held, that everyone getting in a room, having these panels, having these sessions that were, of course, I wait every year for it. It's, it's really the forum, you know, to, to get everyone on that same page and think about, um, how are we coordinating these various interests and parties, and 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 not st and being mindful not only um, not stepping on each other, but also getting some of those synergies that we could see. So um, I don't have a neat answer for you, unfortunately. Um, you know, there, there there used to be a ports and terminals back in the day, or ports and trades. Like, let's your guys <laughs> ask EDC about that. Mm -hmm. um, um, r recognize, however, that um, certainly. I wouldn't stay at this if I didn't feel that there's progress being made, that people are getting out of their silos more, that they're, that certainly, again, EDC and I are on talking every other day, if not every day, about a new project, about how do we sync up on, on different initiatives throughout the city. The, the, water, the um, Educational Tallship Water Trail was a great initiative, DOC NYC. So the sharing of information, it, it's undeniable now. It's just you, you have to talk. These things are interconnected. Um, what happens when you do land? What happens when you get off your boat? You know, all those connection points. And uh, sorry, I don't have a cleaner answer, but I, it's, it's happening. At well, government speed, perhaps, but it's happening. Right. And it's not, it's not too slow. It, it's, it's happening. So thank you so much for your, for your time. And my last vision statement really is about um, thinking about places like Red Hook that were impacted by Sandy and so many of our waterfronts were that, that these places and these bases, these launching sites become more than just access to the waterfront. It becomes a real opener for people to think about the water as it comes up, sea, level, sea levels are rising, and our, our young people, are, I think, are gonna have to take, take, the, take the helm very, very soon. And, and so these access points can be just the beginning of a whole realization about how they can think about waterfront communities, especially those who live, it, live in it, like in the Red Hook houses, and never get to go experience it. And, and, and they can be part of shaping the next, the next version of our, our waterfront cities. And, and finally also immigrants and thinking about people who aren't speaking English. And though I think Waterfront Alliance and, and partners have done a better job of, of really engaging multi using multilingual uh, resources to make sure that people from every community get invited, uh, welcome to the table and engage so many of the cultural cultural experiences from our immigrant communities come with waterfront 
histories, and that needs to be part of this discussion too. So thank you so much for your time, and sleep on it, and let's keep talking. Sounds thank good you. to me. Thank you, Council Member Menchaca. All right. Um, we are, I think we're going to let you go. So soon? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> um, yes, uh, but I, I, I do want to piggyback on, on that. Council Member Deutsch has a very real concern that um, needs to be addressed. And uh, I'm sure you'll get back to him with some concrete answers, right? Okay, and, um, and I want you to work on some way to make sure that the public really knows how to be safe on the water. And um, I think it should be mandated that they have some sort of communication device to indicate if there's a need for, for help or, or a safety issue. Good. Am yeah, I, am that I was done? good. Because the mar the marine radio conversation, just just to um, just to be clear, uh, has consumed a lot of uh, mindshare among the various stakeholders throughout the harbor, um, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Um, there was harbor operations committees where, where that was the whole topic, and um, uh, as a division, we we certainly feel that it's important for people to know what tools are out there and they're properly trained. However, there's a lot of consternation about putting marine radios in the hands of untrained individuals, mm -hmm. that oversaturation is a real concern. These, the, this is the device that Neo Panamax vessels are, are communicating with, with pilots. If you clog mm -hmm. those airways, mm -hmm. there, there's a real concern that you could create bigger hazards out there. Similarly, the, the human powered boating community themselves has said that mm -hmm. they don't feel that that's necessarily an effective, the most effective way of ensuring their safety um, or, you know, to communicate mm -hmm. efficiently. Um, so it's, it's, look, it's I absolutely understand. an ongoing and, conversation. And that's yeah. a legitimate concern. Is there something that's a little lower tech yeah. than that? I, I mean, you know, because, I mean, we're in the 21st century. You can't tell me that we can't have some kind of communication device that will not influence the Panamex vehicles yeah. and, and our ferries and their navigational systems. You know, and that's, and that's what make, I'm talking about. That's a whistle about. or an air horn, yeah, and that's mandated by Coast Guard. That's not good enough. Okay, <laughs> thank you. We'll sure. talk offline. Yes. Thank Look you. forward to it. Thank you, okay. Chair Rose. Thank you. Our next panel will be Roland Lewis from the Waterfront Alliance, Edward J. Kelly from the Maritime Association of Ports of New York and New Jersey, and Rob Buchanan, um, New York City Water Trail Association. And you guys are, are pros at this, so identify yourself and we can begin. And um, in order to give everyone uh, the opportunity to testify, we're going to ask that you keep your remarks to two minutes. And can we set the clock? And, and thank you so much for your patience. And you can begin. Hi, my name is Rob Buchanan. I'm from the New York City Water Trail Association, which is a, a group that aims to represent the common interests of the the uh, community boathouses and the independent human power boaters in the harbor. Uh, I don't have written comments today. Uh, was, did not think I'd be able to come until the last minute, but I just wanted to respond to two, two things very quickly. Um, and the first is the idea that a mandated training program for human power boaters would somehow be an improvement over the system that we have. I don't think that a centralized state-designed or city-designed training program would be better than what we've got. We've got a lot of great community boathouses that have done a lot of really hard thinking about the particular place that they're in, and their training programs and safety protocols are designed around what they do, and they're carried out by people who have the most experience and the most knowledge. So 
I don't think, for instance, that a Coast Guard mandatory Coast Guard training program would address the specific issues of small boat navigation in New York Harbor nearly as effectively as the non-mandated programs that we have now. And I think there's, there's a collective desire to find, when possible, non-regulatory solutions. And this is a good example of that. I also think it's really a mistake to point to the ferry kayak accident last August as an example of training a, a training shortfall. I just don't think that that is a good example of that at all. In fact, if there's any training shortfall that I see, having read very carefully read the Coast Guard report, that, that would have to be on the ferry operator side. So uh, I'd like to hear some more discussion about mandatory safety training for ferry operators as those systems continue to grow. I, I really think, read closely, that's what that report says. Um, and the third thing I'd like to say is that in ongoing, if we're going to have, and I, I'm glad that you've convened this discussion and you, you've stuck with it because I don't think it should just be Coast Guard or even a you know, state discussion, but that the city council is interested in this. But what I would like to say is if we're going to convene a group uh, to discuss these things, like the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, you've got to make sure that one of the voices on that board is uh, from the human power boating community. Without that voice, I just don't think it's a real and complete discussion. And I'm, I'm not clear on what the makeup of the board is going to be, but I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't heard that there will be a uh, representative of our community. That's it. Thanks. I just, since you um, said that, I just want you to know we did expand um, the number of people who would be on the WOMAB. And, um, and what that would look like. And we did include um, people from the human power, the recreational boaters also. Oh, okay, it'd be good to know who those people are because I haven't, I haven't heard anything about well, that. Well, you know, I would like to too because I, my frustration is and continues to be that um, it has not been convened that people have not been uh, appointed on the administration side and that it's being held up. So um, as soon as I know, you will know, and I want you to know that I'm, I'm pushing that, I'm, I'm really pushing for that to happen and for us to be able to appoint and convene a meeting. So as soon as I know, you'll know. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Kelly. I'm the executive director of the Maritime Association of the Port of New York, New Jersey. Uh, we represent over 560 corporate and individual members, paid membership. Uh, since 1873, we have been the primary voice for the commercial maritime industry, representing international shipping lines, marine terminals, longshore labor, pilots, uh, and a host of others. Uh, we might point out First of all, it's interesting that we're moving here and speaking about the Park Department when in fact most marine traffic has nothing to do with the Park Department. So every little piece that can be addressed and fixed is helpful. Uh, there have been over 4,800 deep sea vessels that transit this port and enter it every year. None of them having sunk, that means 9,600 various uh, transit in and out. And the Coast Guard Vessel Traffic System reports over 455,000 harbor transits in the course of a year. We are an estuarine port. We're subject to currents, tides, and there's exceptional cross traffic. This port is complex, congested, and yes, dangerous to those who do not know how to operate properly. The key to safety is to have knowledgeable, experienced personnel operating properly maintained and equipped vessels. Our organization, the Maritime Association, uh, does in fact host and we are the sponsor of very many committees, several of whom I've heard mentioned during the course of the morning, including our Harbor Navigation and Operating Committee. Since uh, World War I was instituted in 1914 at the request of the War Department, continues today. Uh, that is our committee. It is not Coast Guard sponsored, but they do are heavily involved. The Education Subcommittee is one of ours. We have taken barge committees, passenger vessel, marine terminal vessel uh, committees, etc. Our education committee is where we primarily try to interface with recreational boaters. Uh, I'm glad to see that people do appreciate 
Uh, we were the sponsor. We paid for so I guess that makes us the sponsor of the Safe, Safe Harbor U.S. video. We were the organizer of last year's Shared Harbor Tour, and we're in the process of looking to set one up again this year. Uh, and we are willing to work with any organization that promotes safety and safe interaction among anybody who's on the water, whether it be from parks, commercial, private, out of state, federal, military, whomever. So we stand ready to work with anybody. Uh, just one very quick thing. We do feel that New York State is inadequately regulated as far as motor vessels compared to most other sea states. Uh, there was legislation uh, put through with uh, Sandy Galliff that was referenced in, in uh, 2014. Uh, in our estimation, it's insufficient. Uh, there should be a higher standard. And we feel that in most cases, we preach to the choir. Uh, most of the boathouses, especially human-powered uh, craft, are very well organized. And there is a very responsible and professional group of people out there that are conversant with the rules of the road, that know how to operate with tides, currents, cross traffic, federal channels, etc. And we're very pleased to work with them. And I think we all need collectively to find ways to better educate those who are not properly educated and set some standards for safety on the waterway. We would not allow our children to walk on the FDR. We should not allow them to be on our harbors either without proper supervision, training, and or certifications. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rose. Roland Lewis, uh, President and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance, an alliance of uh, now over a thousand <laughs> different businesses and civic organizations dedicated to an open, resilient, and healthy harbor for everybody. Um, I'll just sort of second what I, my two colleagues here and give them a lot of credit. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the level of safety, actually, that, uh, on our harbor is, is remarkable given the traffic. Uh, it goes on and, and the, the, the variety of uses. Um, it's, the one, it's the busiest harbor in, in uh, the United States of America, may, uh, maybe one of the busiest in the entire world. And the fact that there isn't uh, more accidents is remarkable. If, it, I, if we had the same level of safety on our streets, there'd be uh, uh, Vision Zero would be more than a dream right now. So I just want to give that. We, we also are co sponsor with my colleague uh, Ma Maggie Flanagan, Captain Flanagan, helped organize that Shared Harbors tour. and. We will work with Ed and, and Rob and others to uh, make sure that this dialogue and education goes forward. Um, I would like to just uh, pivot toward uh, a couple of other issues that were brought up today and, and, and finish up with LAMAB, our favorite topic. Um, the, uh, uh, the, we recently released the Harbor Scorecard, which, uh, uh, among other things, uh, was a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood analysis of, of the amount of uh, resilience, water quality, and access. And it showed that there are many parts of the city, including your own district, where, where access to the water is severely limited. Um, uh, we have one, points of access, including them all, one so every four miles of linear miles, and that is just not enough in, in many, uh, many neighborhoods, um, creating more spots where there can be, whether it's ferry traffic, uh, kayak locks, whatever's appropriate in that area um, to be created, and having the capital dollars to do that will allow this burgeoning use of the waterfront to happen in safe and good places. And again, I remind us that these, these boathouses that, that, that create these safe uh, are key to that. We've also done a job for the um, Brooklyn Bridge Park called the, I'll be there in a minute, uh, Maritime Activation Plan, uh, which, which we went to uh, dozens and dozens of experts talking about how that park could better utilize its maritime resources. That's great for that park with, that, with the resources to, to, to utilize our expertise there. But that kind of work uh, should be done for every park. Uh, every whether you know Soundview, Canarsie, all these waterfront parks and all the neighborhoods should be thinking more creatively about points of access, how it can be safely incorporated into the planning, break the fourth wall to get people into the park. And the last thing I'd like to say this is about the wool map. I hope we do get that together. I'm, I share your frustration. Um, I, as I was saying to Rob before, I'm the most knowledgeable person outside of city government about it, and I don't know nothing about what's going on. So, um, but. What uh, Councilman Machak was talking about, and I, I, I think uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Nate Grove was uh, alluding to, we have a 21st century waterfront now. It's different than the Department of Ports and Terminals that was uh, active and governed much of the waterfront before. There's all sorts of activity going on, and we don't have governance to match. 
So uh, the WMAP is a step in the right direction for a civic voice, but I do still believe there should be a mayor's office of the waterfront or a department of the waterfront or a waterfront development corporation or something that's thinking holistically about the different, you know, the, the, the very active port we have, the transportation we're, we're, we're enjoying now, the new recreation we're doing. All these things are important and need to be meshed together uh, uh, with a holistic way of looking at it, and we just don't have it right now. It's still balkanized amongst agencies, and it's something I hope this, uh, this, this uh, committee can take a, a strong leadership role in, in trying to uh, bring forth. I, I totally agree. I thank you all for your, your comments. Um, uh, there is no mayoral agency that has oversight, and, and I think that's really um, a problem, uh, especially for a 21st century waterfront. Um, and it's something that I, I would like to look into um, changing. Um, the WOMAB, uh, like I said, I am I'm doing everything I can to get that on board and, and start it up and running. And um, I think before the end of this year, we should see something, I'm hoping. Um, I want, may I add, may I, Debbie, just the one existential issue I did not mention was sea level rise and climate change. So again, that, that in, impacts the, our harbor too. So oh. that's, you know. It's something that, we need that, to. That, knitting all this together be in, on in top one of. year. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Right, and I just wanted to say to Rob, um, um, I um, meant no slight for the, the training that's going on in the boathouses and among the av advocate groups, but my frustration is, is that I want to make sure that everybody gets it. I, I don't want it to be, you know, voluntary or, or contingent upon, you know, if they get the information, if they take the voting safety class. I, I want everybody to have that body of knowledge getting into whatever craft they choose to um, to navigate the waters of New York Harbor. And, and that was not, and I did not mean any slight to the groups that are doing it. I just want to make sure that everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. and, and that was my point. So I thank you all for your comments. And the next um, panel is Jacqueline Crow from Staten Island. All right, you took the ferry. <laughs> um, and Grace, Grace um, Birchall. Oh, I'm sorry, Graham. You know, Graham, you you're gonna have to um, print differently because I always call you something other than. Graham, I'm sorry, and um, Pamela Pettyjohn from Coney Island Beautification Project. Um, you can just get seated, identify yourself, and you can begin to t your testimony. can begin whenever you're seated. Um, you check your microphone. There it went. Okay. I'm Jacqueline Crow. I'm a board member of Kayak Staten Island. We are a nonprofit group under the umbrella of the Gowanus Dredgers from Brooklyn. I'm a me medium mobility kayaker with nine years experience managing public programs through Kayak Staten Island. In my professional life, I'm a genetic counselor with working at both hospitals in Staten Island. Um, I would also like to thank the committee for um, inviting me to testify. In regards to safety and regulation of kayaking in New York waterways, I and Kayak Staten Island feel education should be emphasized and supported before and eventually coordinated with any future regulation. Um, currently the permit provided by the Parks Department, from my understanding, it pertains solely to launching from the designated Parks Department launch sites. Um, you can launch anywhere along the shoreline in Staten Island and you don't need that permit. And I, I, from my understanding, it's not recognized by really any other entities. If you meet the Coast Guard out in the water, they don't really care about the park's permit. Um, but it's just, you know, first step. I don't feel that those have been that accessible. Um, I think that's greatly improved. Uh, um, 
I feel we should discuss whether, an, just as uh, Councilwoman Rose had mentioned, whether an educational component should be tied to obtaining a permit and if the permit should be expanded and recognized by other agencies. Um, you know, regulating itself costs money and I think money could be better spent supporting some of the education requirement uh, uh, programs that are already out there. Um, I, I personally did not know that there was a video on the Parks Department website. Um, I know in my work at hospitals for ethics compliance, I have to watch a video, I have to click, click, click at certain times mm -hmm. and to get mm -hmm. through the, and then, then you could print your permit. That might be an idea that it, it's a required watching because although I agree with the other gentleman that was here that the kayaking programs are doing a great job with education, there are people that aren't involved with us. Mm -hmm. There are fishermen that go out on their own mm -hmm. um, and in fact many times they want nothing to do with us. They want mm -hmm. to be on their own. So, and from living on Staten Island, um, those are, tend to be the ones that get in trouble, mm -hmm. that have to be rescued. Right. They don't have the safety equipment, they got the long boat for what they're doing. I think the education program shouldn't just be a standard kayaking safety, it should be what boats work in the New York, it should be specific to New York waterways. What boats work in the, in the you should use, you know, fishing, um, paddling around the shoreline versus going into the shipping channels. So that should be included in that. Um, and I, I, I have more here, but I better stop. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Good, good, good afternoon, good and thank afternoon. you so much. Uh, this, my name is Pamela Pettyjohn. I'm the president of the Coney Island Beautification Project. The uh, statement that you have in front of you is from my colleague from Charlie Denson in the History Project. Okay. I'm just gonna read one paragraph at the bottom, uh, okay. which is addressing the uh, jet skis and, um, and Coney Island Creek. We think that it should be reduced to five miles an hour, limited to five miles an hour, and place warning buoys located at the mouth of Coney Island Creek, at Calvert Box, Kaiser Park, Six Diamonds Park, uh, jet skis endanger park visitors along the shoreline and store up pollutants in the shallow waters. Um, these watercrafts also absorb, uh, disturb wildlife, including waterfowl, breeding horseshoe crabs, and turtles. It's an ongoing problem. This is addressing some right. of what uh, Councilman yes. Traeger was, but, saying. Uh, it was right. saying. But we'd like to talk about, um, uh, we still, Coney Island Beautification Project is an environmental advocacy group. We work with, with about 15 schools and about 100 organizations. Um, some of them, we are sitting here, right here in this uh, room right now. We still do independent water um, testing with mm -hmm. Rob Buchanan, and we are still finding that there are extremely high levels of contamination mm -hmm. and, and um, biologicals in this water. We also have found that DEC is uh, one of their programs is dumping contaminated water into um, Coney Island Creek. Um, we have tried, uh, I think it was uh, the gentleman from the Parks Department, it was hard to see from around the uh, pillar, uh -huh. but we talk about the, uh, the kids and the, what the lighting up of their faces and when they're interacting and with the water. Um, Graham is one of our partners also. We've been trying to bring ca kayaking. We, um, were, we did not get permits from the Billion Oyster Project in order to put the Oyster Project in Coney Island Creek to clean up the waters, uh, EDC, no, I'm sorry, DEP said uh -huh. that the water was too contaminated and refused the permits. Um, and a day later, we see that the governor um, launched a um, Oyster Project in Long Island Sound to clean it up. Um, we need help with uh, this with continuous dumping. Um, this is a viable waterways where people are fishing, they are swimming, they people are being baptized here. Um, Coney Island Beautification Project is also a very proud um, uh, a member of the. Uh, well, we have the um, city of Water Day. I'm so sorry, just <laughs> I'm trying to rush through my, my testimony. We are one of the anchor sites for City of Water Day, so. We have been working to bring water programming and activities to Coney Island Creek, to the, Con uh, to the community, and uh, we're still being sought with dumping of oil spills, uh, illicit uh, dumping, and, and, um, and we need help. Okay. 
Thank you. Hi, uh, Graham Bertrand. Hi, Graham. Hi. <laughs> uh, as you know, President Downtown Botas, uh, for the record, again, no other organization represents us in any way. Uh, we are friends, affiliated. Um, I, I got two issues briefly I want to go over what to do with safety, which is the, the, the city allows private developers to write safety studies for, for parts of the waterfront of New York City. And really, this is just a scam. It's got to stop. It was here, used here in, in lower Manhattan to take what is the best beach in, in Manhattan and basically say people can't even walk on it, right? So I'd like the city to stop this, this, this habit and I'd like you to review any of these safety studies that have been done by private developers of public waterfront land and basically get them out of there. And then the second issue I'm bringing up here is, is the one of that sometimes the city essentially has lower safety standards for people who pay to go boating than people who don't pay. And of course, most people in New York don't pay, they go for free. So it's rather annoying that, that private concessionaires get access to beaches that I'm not allowed to access to provide a free community program to. And the argument is safety, that's why it's keeping me off. People pay $500 to $1,000, they get to use that beach and go boating. That shouldn't happen. It's actually the same beach right here in Lower Manhattan. You can't even walk on it. Right, so that's the two big, you know, if the city's going to play games of safety, that's a problem. Now, coming back to your concern about teaching safety, um, we have been working with the Coast Guard. We've taught over 100 people classes to do with radio safety, but as other people mentioned, the Coast Guard really doesn't want you to use a radio. Mm -hmm. But in the last two weeks, we have been teaching those classes to over 100 people. I personally have written a kayaker's guide to New York Harbor. It's free, it's available, it's over 50 pages, describes everything to do with New York Harbor. So you can download it, share it, right? It's out there, but let's turn this around. I want the harbor to be a safe harbor, and I, the same way I want streets to be safe streets. I, you know, we don't regulate bicycle users. We shouldn't regulate, we should build safe harbors, right? To, to give you the example of the Midtown Ferry kayak accident, the city built the busiest ferry terminal in the city next to, one, next to a kayak boathouse. And that kayak boathouse, they gave that concessionaire to a group that does kayak trips in front of that kayak terminal. Well, who's to blame here? Now, the, the captain is to blame, the ferry company is to blame, but the city is to blame. The city is not building a safe waterfront, right, for 8 million people, right, for children, for beginner boaters. That's the fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Thank you. Um Thank you, uh, and um, I think if we had the WOMAB in place, I think this would be a good thing to bring to them. Um, you make a, a, a very cogent point. And it's like the fox guard in the hen house, right? Okay. Um, we have duly noted, and uh, we'll discuss that. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Noah Salem Diary. Um, David Matten. And Jennifer Ratner. Noah, no? Okay. Okay. Noah, Noah, no. Noah, no. Um, you can identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, you my can name begin. Is, my name is David Matten. I'm representing the Long Island City Community Boathouse. Hi. Uh, we operate uh, free public programming, well, boating programs in Long Island City and Astoria. Um, we would like to see parts involved um, not just in, well, the main parts that have been discussed today, but in the decision processes that surround uh, the access points not just on parks property, but on those what we'll call parks adjacent. So a particular example we'll cite is um, Hallett's Cove in Astoria has effectively been parks property. The water itself has been parks. The only use for this water has been for parks program that we provide for about 10 years. Um, 
The introduction of the NYC ferry to this has put that program into jeopardy. Uh, it may not be able to run next year. Uh, it remains to be seen. Um, as far as we can tell, nobody from Parks was involved, even though the main upland access point is through park space. Uh, nobody from Parks was involved in the decisions or surrounding particular arrangement uh, of the installation of this ferry. So the analogy I had was it's, it's essentially they've put a subway stop in the middle of a parkland and told people it's okay to go play on the tracks as long as they don't see the bus coming, you know, the train coming. Um, the involvement that we've been speaking to EDC for about two years, us and other uh, these paddling groups, about the particular problem here, but similar problems in other places. Uh, Stuyvesant Cove is one of them. Uh, and we really didn't get much satisfaction out of the outcome, uh, the final decisions that were made. Uh, they were made within EDC and seemingly involved no one else. The Councilman Costa's office was not familiar with this particular difficulty, nor were the residents groups. They were, they were quite surprised when we told them that this could mean an end to these programs. So we would like to see parks involved in that decision process in advance. Okay. Thank you. I'm yes, you can go. Okay. I'm Jennifer Ratner. I'm the board chair of Friends of the East River Esplanade, 60th to 120th Streets. Um, we're the conservancy for the waterfront that stretches from East Harlem down to Yorkville on the Upper East Side. It's the only continuous area of accessible or built waterfront in that area. We're community members who love and use the Greenway, runners, bikers, walkers, fishermen, some boaters. We have uh, one of the boating groups that was mentioned earlier, East River Crew, launches off of this area of the waterfront. And our organization is dedicated to restoring and reinventing this area. I'll point out that this um, stretch of waterfront is probably, I think it's the most densely populated area in all of New York, so we have hundreds of thousands of community members who live within less than a mile of the waterfront. Um, and you know, the General Assembly you know, puts it out there this week that we're also kind of the gateway to New York City. And if you look at it, we're actually a waterfront that is literally falling in. Uh, you may be aware um, or familiar with the about 50 foot section of this waterfront that fell in just behind Gracie Mansion just a few months ago. Um, and there are many other areas of this waterfront that have holes in them that have been there not just for days or months, but actually for years. And you can see the East River lapping underneath them. This has really never been adequately cared for. And um, my point is a little different than others here today because I wasn't sure of the topic of this, but it, it fits in where you're talking about a mayoral office for the waterfront because it's not even at this point an issue of money. There's been over $35 million um, allocated to the restoration of this esplanade of this waterfront for, over, for about four years now. And it's the Parks Department's job to spend that money. And we love and respect the Parks Department. I work with them every day as a volunteer. Um, but there needs to be some o oversight in how that money is spent. It hasn't been spent. And that area that fell in, luckily without people on it, that was on their phase one list to repair for years um, and hadn't been repaired. And luckily nobody was standing there. And there are many, many other um, examples of this along that waterfront. And so I really urge uh, the committee members um, in parks and waterfront to really, we have new waterfronts coming north and south. Um, but we got to take care of what we already have, and somebody has to be give, doing oversight of the Parks Department that the money that's been allocated isn't just kind of a PR stunt and actually gets spent and gets spent appropriately. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your um, concern about the waterfront. And, um, yeah, we have some concerns with parks and how long it takes for projects to happen or not to happen. And uh, I'll, I'll be glad to follow up on, on that particular issue. Um, our waterfront is really our gateway and uh, we have to maintain it. We have to maintain it. And um, what I would like to do is uh, for those of you who have issues with parks and on the waterfront, um, I'd like to convene a meeting 
so that we could have a, a dialogue with them. I, I think your concerns are valid, and uh, I think we should facilitate a meeting to have that dialogue. Great. So I thank you again for your for your testimony, and um, right. thanks so much. And that, um, that concludes the hearing of the joint session with New York, uh, with the City Council Parks Committee and Waterfront Committee. Um, and this meeting is adjourned at 310. Thank you.